So welcome. Thank you for sitting down with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. I would say one of the biggest challenges of, I would presume, of adapting Beauty and the Beast into a live action film is that it's arriving in theaters in 2017, not 1991. Emma, how did you modernize Belle so that girls and women would recognize her as one of their own today? You know, I feel that the original Belle um, was very progressive and quite modern for her time. And I think it was a case of kind of defending and protecting her original DNA and making sure that it wasn't kind of uh, amalgamated into the concept or idea of a Disney princess. Because actually, she was a bit of a departure. And I was very keen on kind of like keeping that that way. For example, there was a line that was written in the film, which was, um, you know, we're going to make you look like a princess. And I was like, I said to Belle, I was like, the whole thing about Belle is that she doesn't want to marry a handsome prince. So do you mind if I say, oh, I'm not a princess? And he was like, yeah, sure, go for it. And I was like, OK, great. Um, so it's little tweaks to dialogue. Um, it was uh, kind of co-opting what had originally been a Maurice um, storyline, which was him as an inventor, mm -hmm. which I knew that Kevin wasn't going to use. And I wanted to use it for Belle because I wanted her to have a vocation. I wanted her to have a bit more of a backstory. I wanted us to understand her a little better. And um, so that was really fun, giving her that quality. Um, you know, and I think it was it, it wasn't so much the big things as catching the small little little details, you know, down to like, you know, in the original she wears ballet shoes for the entirety of the movie. And I wanted to make sure that she really looked like she could do something, that she could ride a horse, that she could fight a pack of wolves. It's hard to do that in ballet it, shoes. It's pretty hard to do that in ballet shoes. And so I've tried. Yeah. Dan's tried yeah. many times. So anyway, it was it was just catching yeah. those little things, those little details, yeah. And Dan, is the beast as beastly? As in the in the animated yes. film? I hope so. I think, um, you know, we've definitely retained some of the, uh, you know, the monstrous animal side of him. But I think also what we tried to retain was was the beast's humor. And there's, you know, he's definitely a character that makes you laugh in that film. And I, I wanted that to be preserved as well. Um, and so in exploring that, you know, obviously the, the animated film, the comedy comes from a bit more of a cartoony mm -hmm. sort of place. And... Uh, so we looked at you know ways in which he could be funny in this, and ways in which Beast might make Emma Watson's Bell laugh. And so he, you know, I think he had to have a, a, a wit, a dry sense of humor, and intelligence about him. So yeah, we sort of you know I, I think we've we've been faithful to the fact that Beast is funny, just in a in a slightly different different mm -hmm. way. Come come, show me the smile. <gasps> oh my dear. Oh, no. And that you came from a world of CGI for years and years and years and years in the I Harry did. Potter films. I did. So did, the, did some of that feel like old hat to you this time around? Um, I felt very grateful for having had the kind of um, Harry Potter in many ways was the best acting school I could ever have attended because I had to do it all, like scenes with animals, scenes with special effects, um, scenes with stunts, um, all sorts of things were going on. And so I think it did prepare me well for this. Mind you, I think bringing Beast to life um, and making sure that you could really feel on screen the human chemistry of two people falling in love, you know, really took on its own challenges. And, you know, I think Having a real actor there in the scene with me was was pretty amazing. Um, figuring out how to dance with Dan on stilts, pretty difficult. <laughs> That's what um, I was going to ask me. What was the most awkward thing to do? Uh, probably that. Probably that. Uh, or walk down the stairs. That was that was quite. <laughs> that tough. was really difficult. Fortunately, there's that moment where they hold hands. And I was very very grateful <laughs> for Emma. I being loved there. it. There were some amazing sort of role reversal moments in in our story actually, which is one of the reasons I love it, and in real life. In that it was sort of me going down. I've got I've got you. I've got you. Down. Like, it's like, it's like, I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. Or like doing the dance and being like, you know, I was the stabilizer. I was mm -hmm. the I was the balancing force actually, and. Um, I was certainly very grateful for Emma's experience with this kind yeah. of world of, of CGI madness. And uh, I think there are yeah, plenty of actresses who would have looked at me far stranger than Emma ever did. Unfortunately, it's a story about looking past monstrous exteriors mm -hmm. and seeing the human happening inside, yes. which Emma's really good at. Oh.
<laughs> now, the one element of Beauty and the Beast that ages a little bit differently than the rest of the story is that, in essence, Belle falls in love with her captor. You'll join me for dinner. That's not a request. I'm, I'm just curious, how did you adapt that element of this film in a way that makes sense to you today? Right. Yeah, the Stockholm Syndrome question. Mm -hmm. It's um, Well, it's, it's funny because I watched it the other night, and I, I watched it so differently than I did when I was a kid watching... I, it made sense to me when I was a kid that Belle right. would fall in love with the Beast because they had such a unique relationship. But through an adult's eyes, yeah. it is a bit different. I mean, I suppose the moment at which she falls in love with him and he with her really is the moment where he, he sets her free. And that's the only moment at which that love can take place, really. I mean, I think there, there's an affection building uh, slowly, but um, but really it comes it comes from a, a place that Beast doesn't really recognize when he, he, he sets Belle free. And... I don't know. Would you would you go along with that? I would totally go along with that. I mean, I think um, you know, it was it was something that I wrestled with and I sort of questioned and I, you know, I really I I thought about deeply. And then I remember really I was like, okay, I need to look up. I really just need to remind myself what the definition of Stockholm syndrome is. And it's actually when the captive takes on the views and opinions and um, she they she adopt the cause yeah ado yeah, yeah the, when they adopt the style. cause and yeah. um, Belle never does that she d basically disagrees with Beast on most things and tries to escape whenever she can and she just keeps her independence of mind and her independence of thought so I realized immediately that that didn't fit. Um, I also think that it was very important to me that you saw moments where you understood that Belle had a choice to come back and stay and rescue Beast, and she that's a conscious decision that she makes. And I think that was a very important mm -hmm. point, point yeah. for me, mm -hmm. um, feeling comfortable with with that concept. Now, in this one, there's much more backstory about both of your characters. You both lost your mothers in very similar ways, it seemed. Um, how did that kind of feed into their connection, do you think? Oh, it, I think it really does. Yeah, it's not overly explicit, but I think it's definitely something that uh, that they have in common that, that, that unites them. And um, I mean, there's a few there's a few things, really. Um, a sense know. of loss, I think, a sense of being outsiders, a sense of not belonging. Um, these are these are the these are the points of connection that Dan and I were trying to find for for what they have in common and how they fall in love and um, yeah I think uh, I hope we I hope we pulled it off <laughs> I think we pulled it off. <laughs> how young were you when you first were told that you looked kind of like Belle? Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, I think you look a lot like, I mean, everybody thinks you look like her, but I'm curious how young were you when people started telling you this? That's so interesting. I didn't think, I don't think anyone ever told me that. Mm -hmm. My big dilemma, my big trauma as a young woman was I wanted to be Emma Bunton from the Spice Girls. <laughs> and my best friend had blonde hair, but my name was Emma. And this was a big controversy of who got to be her in the group and um why why uh, was it emma bunton or baby spice particularly baby spice right. <laughs> baby spice yeah the spice girls that was my big drama um did you ever meet her you know what i never have and i think if you i can did make that happen. I in think fact so. oh no oh, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> um that yeah it's so funny <laughs> um but uh yeah i i mean yeah. <laughs> Let's leave that there. Okay. That's, uh, that's new information to me. That's very exciting. Um, you guys get some new songs in this film. We do, yes. yeah. Uh, which one did you sing in the shower the most? What, what I, I sang Evermore a lot. I mean, that was, yes. Uh, I was singing it all over the house to the extent that my kids then started singing it. And I heard my son sort of singing it. <laughs> He, he kind of came up with his own little version of it. I heard him playing one day in his room and he was sort of singing it. And uh, yeah, so I, I sang it a lot. Um, but amazing to work with, with Alan Menken and, and you know have him write some new music that sits alongside the, the great music that already exists. I just listened to Beauty and the Beast just because it made me happy. I didn't I, I didn't even get to sing it. I don't even have anything to do with it, really. I just, um, it's so catchy, that tune. It's so catchy. And I think it, it's really the heart and the spirit of the film is that is that song. And like... It just gets you in the mood 
just gets you in the zone, you know? It's like, yeah, we're gonna be, we're gonna do a Disney musical. It's happening. And then on a bookish question, Ooh. your characters seem to know some Shakespeare lines by heart. Do you guys yes. know like what lines from books do you guys keep memorized or that you go back to? Ooh. Oof. God. I do love a quote. I yeah. love a quote. I love a good quote, and I like, can't remember any of good, them. I know. I was good. I'm <laughs> putting them on the spot. That's always, that, always the way. Or is there a book um, that you guys go to when you really just need, like, a, I don't know. Some yes. comfort. Some comfort, yeah. Can I tell you a really embarrassing one? Yes. I would say don't tell anyone, but this is an interview. <laughs> um, but, yeah, whenever I'm ill or unwell or, like, ill and unwell are the same thing, but, uh, or, sorry, I was going to say, like, really jet-lagged and I can't sleep. Um, I watched Julie and Julia. Yes. Like, I... I'm terrified, actually, how many times my <laughs> iTunes player would tell me that I've watched that film. That's it's why in, I read Julia in, Child's book when she was in Paris, because I watched that and I was like, I need to read the source material. <laughs> yeah, this is so good. But it's like that perfect like mix of like sort of food porn shots where you're like, oh, French food, like, oh, so good. And then like there's something so comforting about Meryl Streep and Amy Adams in that movie. It's just... <laughs> It's like comfort food. I'll go. I'll go and make myself a bowl of cereal, and I'll watch Julie and Julia. I'll accept that. Do you have a comfort it. movie? I do. I suppose with Nell and I, it's a an old British movie made in the early eighties. That's so much more sophisticated <laughs> than mine. Is it though? I don't know if it's sophisticated, <laughs> but it's certainly. I can watch it any time of the day or night. I love it I inside guess, and out. Um, I guess and it's this one is that when, I quote a lot with my friends. This is when I tell you that I love Teen Witch. Oh, there you go. Great See? choice. Thank Sometimes you. Sometimes you need to just regress <laughs> yeah. a bit, you know? I Teen Wolf. I no, love Teen it's Wolf. important to go for Teen Witch, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. <laughs>